So our presentation here tonight, we're going to look at various different elements of wild camping in the Arctic. So we're going to look at the locations that we go to. Uh, we're going to look at the weather and Tim's presentation uh, set it up perfectly for that. Uh, we're going to look at travel and by travel, I mean traveling out there on the snow. How do we actually travel? Um, we're going to then obviously look at the shelter. How do we uh, camp and uh, the various uh, options we have for that? Staying warm is a big, very important part of just surviving in that, those conditions out there and that environment uh, and the equipment then that goes with that. Uh, obviously, we need to know what we need to be bringing and know how to use it. And a lot, a lot of time we get questions coming up around uh, food and water. Um, you know, what sort of food we should be eating or what do we bring? And then where do you get water in such a frozen environment as well? So those are the uh, seven topics, the seven uh, themes that we'll be taking through our talk this evening. And again, at any stage, just pop in those questions and we will uh, we'll get them as, as, as we go. So locations wise, uh, this is where we play is up the top of uh, Scandinavia and that area that's highlighted in red uh, running through uh, northern Finland, Sweden and um, Norway up towards Tromso as well. And the Arctic Circle, it, if you see Rovaniemi just to the right, bottom right of the red uh, highlighted area, this Arctic Circle cuts through Rovaniemi and then cuts a straight line across and just across the top of Iceland. Iceland actually isn't in the Arctic Circle. A lot of people think it is, but it just cuts across there. So we're, we're kind of between about 150, about 300 kilometers uh, above the Arctic Circle. So first off, the weather, and um, this is a weather forecast from just a few days before we arrived into the Arctic. Um, last year, we managed to get a number of trips, actually all our trips, bar one, done last year before COVID hit. Um, but this is the forecast we were heading out to, and um, when we were just, a few of us were just getting out ahead of the groups, and we were looking at this forecast, and uh, quite a serious forecast, minus 37 degrees, minus 37.6, and... Um, when you land into that temperature coming from a uh, mild Ireland, you know all about it. Uh, it is extremely, very, very cold and uh, it's dangerously cold at those temperatures. Typically though, we wouldn't be in those temperatures all the time. Daytime temperatures for that sort of a region would be kind of minus eight to minus 10 typically. And um, nighttime then can drop to typically kind of minus 20, minus 25. Um, we, with our safety, Protocols, we would have cut off temperatures for our campouts, and generally that's about 26 when we're with, with clients, minus 26. Um, our equipment is rated uh, for around that temperature, and that's kind of where we cut it off when we call it. But the weather, and Tim in his presentation talked about it there, the weather is quite predictable. Um, it isn't always good, but it's predictable. Unlike Ireland, where you know what's going to happen for the next 24 hours reasonably accurately, but in actually in the, in the Arctic regions, you kind of be fairly accurate looking at the next four or five days as to what the weather is going to be. And that makes life a lot easier when it comes to planning and deciding where you're going to go and routes and various different things. Uh, wind is obviously an issue, uh, but you know, again, when the, with an accurate forecast, we're able to actually plan. And that's a big, big part of what we have to be able to do out there uh, in the Arctic. And uh, when we're actually camping, in these conditions, uh, you've got to have all your information and all uh, all added up and a, a very secure, solid plan together. So one thing I suppose that surprised me when I went out there first, the uh, first few years of going out is that they get snow, obviously, and they get a lot of snow, but it generally doesn't come in huge dumps of snow that we get when we get it. Uh, it comes kind of consistently throughout the winter. And uh, this region will typically see the first snows in October, and those will then run through uh, snow showers regularly through to uh, kind of end of April, uh, really in, sometimes into May. But the snow, if, if to get a big storm of snow is, is very unusual. And one year we were out there, uh, we had a group who were out for a week and it, it snowed hot, it's just heavily for three days solid. And we were going out in it, but the locals were miffed that we would actually think about going out in, in these conditions. Um, but it's something I suppose that we're used to when we do get snow here or in Scotland, 
you know, we go out in those conditions, uh, but for them to get three days solid of snow is very unusual. It's more that consistent thing. It just happens regularly throughout the winter. The snow depths as well um, vary very much uh, across the Arctic and across Scandinavia. Um, if I go back to my first map actually here, if you can see my mouse here, uh, if it shows up, down around here, then there's this region down here in Norway, gets massive amounts of snow, meters of snow. You can see sometimes four or five meters of snow on the ground uh, in this area. And it's because of that warm air coming in off the sea, the maritime uh, weather that's coming in, bringing loads of moisture, dumps heaps of snow in here. Whereas up around this region, up in, in our area that we go to, we would typically see maybe about a meter or one and a half meters of snow uh, on the ground uh, during the winter time. So with the weather as well, we have uh, the issue of daylight in the depths of winter. And people think that when you go out to the Arctic in typically we go March, uh, February, March, that it's going to be dark all the time. But it actually it's not uh, because during the period from about mid-December through to mid-January, uh, they, they get the, 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 the 24 hours darkness. Now, it's not fully dark either. You get a twilight coming in around midday. The sun doesn't come above the uh, horizon. but they will have very dark days, but they get that uh, polar uh, twilight uh, during the day, which gives beautiful blue colors. But then from uh, mid-January through to the equinox, the end of March, the daylight is rushing in because by the equinox uh, it, at the end of March, well, they've got the same amount of day and light as we do. Uh, so the daylight change, the amount of uh, time, uh, the amount of sun in the day time is actually increases rapidly uh, as they move into the into end of March and, and the equinox. And this is the sort of weather you're obviously hoping for out there. It's uh, you get the blue sky days and um, you actually get quite a lot of them, which is a great thing about it. And back to that predictability that we can we pretty much, you know, we know when it's going to happen and we can plan around that or opposite side of it as well, that we know we're going to get some very cold uh, or windy, cloudy uh, precipitation, snow, then we can plan around that as well. So planning in that, these Arctic regions is actually easier probably to plan uh, trips uh, and where we're going to go and how we're going to do it when we're out there, rather than it would be to do the same here in Ireland, believe it or not. We're dealing with kind of more extremes and when it comes to temperatures and the amount of snow, uh, but it's predictable and that's, that definitely makes things uh, easier. So how do we travel on this snow? And uh, I said it's about where we go, about anything from about a meter to 1.2 meters of snow under our feet. And if you refer back to that map as well, I showed you where down the southwest of uh, Norway, they're getting all that snow. It's actually quite wet snow. Whereas up here in these regions, they're getting that polar uh, um, influence. And it's actually very dry, uh, extremely dry snow. You will not make any snowmen out of this. You will it'd be impossible even just to make snowballs in your hands out of the snow. It is like sugar, uh, is the best way to describe it. So if you could imagine walking across the ground and underneath your feet, you have a meter of sugar. You're just gonna sink. And then you drag your foot out of that, you put on the next one, you're just gonna sink. And within five minutes, you will just be totally wrecked. It is impossible to walk on this type of snow. It doesn't happen. So we have two choices. We can ski or we can snowshoe. And um, what that does is it disperses our weight over the ground, over the snow, and allows us to move uh, reasonably efficiently. And um, snowshoeing is, is a very easy skill to learn. And um, it means that we can get the snowshoes onto our boots and get out onto the, the snow. And we can pretty much go anywhere on the snow. That's a great way to get into the depths of uh, the mountains and the forests. Um, snowshoeing really allows a, a lot of um, uh, freedom, I suppose is the best way of putting it. And this is actually out across lakes. Uh, these photos here with on frozen lakes with anything maybe about uh, 50 centimeters of ice below our feet. Uh, 
And then the other way is skiing, and we're taking the skis out. Skiing is a little bit harder to learn than the, than the snowshoeing, but it's more efficient and uh, you move faster and um, it's, uh, you, you'll just travel more, you'll get over more ground in a day and uh, use less energy doing it as well. So the skis are the more preferred method for, for travel in these regions. Uh, snowshoeing, great, quick and easy to learn, but takes more energy, not as fast, not as much ground covered, whereas skiing, you will cover that ground harder to learn, but more efficient. So again, out in the lakes. So being the, the person breaking trail on this, it's, it's, it's hard work, even on the skis, whether you're on the snowshoes or skis, breaking trail is, is hard work. So this trail would have been, that you see under Cindy's feet there, would have been broken by the person, a few people ahead of her. Um, so breaking trail is, is a task and it's something that would rotate through the group uh, to open up a trail on this type of ground. So just a question there, I'm just gonna have a look. Oops. Mm -hmm. I can't see the questions. Can you jump in there? Oh yeah, sorry, you see Stephen's question there. So yes, um, this is an important one. If you are thinking of buying snowshoes, if you're buying snowshoes for Ireland, pretty much a snowshoe is a snowshoe. But when you're going to regions like this, um, whether it's uh, like say Canada or uh, Arctic regions, uh, getting the right snowshoe is very important because it all comes down to float. Uh, and that's the amount of surface area on the snowshoe. And that um, basically gives you the ability to float on the snow. Uh, so if you don't get the float right, if you are too heavy for your snowshoes, well, then you're going to sink. And uh, every single but uh, step you take is going to be difficult. Um, some snowshoes will, you can actually get extra plates to put onto them to increase the float. Um, and you will see some massive, huge snowshoes out there. And they're just for the, the heavier folk uh, who will be traveling on this type of sugar snow. Uh, you just, you need that extra, extra uh, float in your shoe in your uh, snowshoe so yes very important um as i said if you are going to regions like that that you get the right type of snowshoe in, in the alps you can kind of get away with you know general purpose uh, type of snowshoe but in the arctic or canada especially as well uh definitely you want to get the right type of snowshoe uh, the right size i should say so I suppose another tag on to Stephen's question there as well is, well, the kit, how do we carry kit? So we can either carry it on our backs or we can carry it in our sleds or as we call them, pulks or pulkas. And um, carrying kit on our backs is not preferable. Um, it's, um, it, it's just, again, that problem of increased weight on snowshoes. We need to take that into account if we've got a heavy backpack on. Uh, it's just a very inefficient way to move, really having them uh, weight on your back. So putting the kit into the pulks is a very efficient way for moving our kit from A to B. Oops. So with the pulks, typically you, your volume is quite big and uh, you know, you'd have maybe 200, 250 liters of volume that yellow pack there that, that is, it's a 120 liter pack and that fits in there with plenty of other kit. Uh, and this is one of the great things that, that I love about folks is that it allows you that little bit of luxury when it comes to bringing those extra things or extra warm things. You have that ability to, uh, to carry those well, to pull them with you. Uh, whereas if you're carrying it on your back, you have to be very conscious that you're going super lightweight if you're carrying it on your back. Whereas pulling the pulk, you can, um, really get more in there and you can uh, have that luxury of uh, those extra items. The pulks come in various different types. You have uh, fiberglass and you have plastic. Uh, you would have rigid poles and then some would be by, by rope as well. So the ones we would use typically would be rigid pole. They're easier control, easier handle, a bit more weight in them I suppose is the downside. Um, but typically as well, they will have this cover that rolls up and uh, it becomes a bit of an art form as to packing them as well. So they get easy access to the, uh, 
essential items, the uh, warm jackets, water, everything else, uh, easy and quickly. Yeah, so even like Kieran, I'm not sure if he's in on the talk here, one of our guides even brought a massive collapsible stove, uh, wood burning stove in one of these as well on one trip. So uh, definitely, you know, this it's, it's, it's quite a luxury having a, a, a pulk to bring with you. Still hard, still hard work pulling a pulk, especially across uh, fresh snow, you're breaking trail. Uh, they are designed to ski uh, to a certain degree, but on, on the softer snow, uh, they are hard work. And um, it, um, they can be an advantage sometimes, especially on, if you're skiing downhill, uh, they can give you st stability when you have the rigid poles that the, this one has here. And, um, but yeah, they, you get into a rhythm and that's, that's once you get that rhythm going, uh, you know, things flow very nicely, but then obviously you have days then when it's a little bit warmer and the snow is sticky um, and it's much harder work. And then you'll have days when it's icy and that's great on the flat, but you got a downhill, you're, you know all about it. And uh, so quite a, you know, quite a lot of skills, I suppose, that go with the skiing and then skiing with a pulk as well, just adds that extra dimension to the whole, the whole thing. So that brings us on to shelter. Well, we're talking about wild camping and uh, yep, we generally camp when we're out there and uh, all of these photos would be taken it out in that region. And um, we would use quite a variety of different types of tents, uh, typically they're tunnel tents or dome tents, uh, whether it's uh, Saleva or um, there's various other ones. It's quite a specialist, um, Samaya from a French one, uh, Hellsports, um, even the Hillybergs and things like that, uh, all designed for quite rough conditions and um, they this is again this is back to what I talked about the luxury with the the, the pokes and the sleds uh, we don't need to go super lightweight with our tents um, all the time uh, so being able to bring a tent that has a little bit more, more room and a bit more space um, is definitely luxury and something that the, the pokes allow us to do you can see on this one here, we're using our skis as well. It's a very windy night, this one. We had quite a lot of snow coming across. So using the skis as poles. Uh, this is a big problem in this region is how to actually peg down the tents because you can't go with your normal pegs that would use here because you, you, you can imagine put them into a bowl of sugar. That, that's what you're doing with your pegs. It just doesn't work. Um, so utilizing the, uh, the skis uh, helps a lot and um, they, they make good anchors generally not always even you know you still can be uh, quite loose so it is problematic actually uh, pegging down tents uh, in that type of snow and that sugar snow as we call it so again sometimes just scrolling through you know if we know from that forecast we're going to have a rough night we'll dig in uh, just getting the tents low getting them down as much as we can um, and getting the shelter from that wind the tents are designed to take you know a quite a serious battering with the winds so up to 100 kilometers an hour uh, some of these tents and saliva tents will be tested for so they will take quite serious winds but at the same time you know if you have a choice of being out in it or being sheltered you're going to put that extra effort in and be sheltered one of the uh, quite unique experiences we get out there as well is to camp on a lake, on a frozen lake. And that's certainly, uh, when you do it the first time, it takes a while to get to sleep, uh, even for me. Uh, it's a different experience. You are, um, typically with the lakes, you have that, you, you have a huge amount of ice on the lakes. It is not going, you're not going to go through it. But when you go to camp on it, you need to clear away some of the snow. And Something with snow, believe it or not, is that if you have a meter of snow, well, up the top, it could be minus 20 degrees, but at the bottom of that snow, it's actually probably around zero uh, degrees. So the snow is act actually acting as an insulator. So you dig down on a lake, you actually almost hit water and slush uh, on the top of the lake. And then you're going camping on this, and it's like, mm, okay, uh, not the nicest start to a nice camping. Um, but you get that cleared, you get the tent up, and um, as you expose that slush, it starts to freeze. So you get your pegs in, you get the tent up, and uh, things do finally solidify, thankfully. Uh, you get up the next morning, and it's, it's hard work getting those pegs out because they've been frozen solid into that what was slush. 
what is now uh, solid ice. So we don't just camp, sometimes we snow hole and um, the back again to that type of snow we get in that region, that sugar snow is not ideal for snowshoeing. But when we do get the right snow, um, where we do in, said in certain parts of Norway, places like that, we get that wetter snow, or if we get snow that's been disturbed, uh, we can dig into it because it's a different consistency. And snow holing, it's hard work building a snow hole, but actually quite comfortable when you have it built uh, because it provides quite a lot of insulation. And it's probably one of the quietest places on earth is in a snow hole. The uh, insulation, the sound insulation is massive. So with, a, with the temperature outside of minus 20, you know, you could easily have kind of a minus eight, minus 10 inside in the snow hole. Um, the insulation um, properties of the snow kick in and really help you. There's a science to it as well as to how to build them, but um, definitely it's something, it's an experience, um, but it's, it's, it's something that we do as often as we can, especially with our groups out there. So there's uh, Dave and Ger. I think we have Dave and Ger on tonight uh, joining us. And uh, they're our Arctic experts uh, at this stage and uh, enjoying a snow hole. And um, one of the tricks to building the snow hole is to create uh, cold air sumps. So we sleep high in the snow hole uh, and our door is actually lower than the snow hole, than the actual sleeping platform, I should say. So what we get is that, well, we learned this from Tim's uh, presentation earlier, is hot air rises and cold air drops. So it means that that traps the warm air uh, within the snow hole and um, cold air drops, falls out the door and the air that stays inside is that little bit warmer and that contributes to that uh, extra little bit of comfort as well. By no means warm in the snow hole, but definitely warmer than it would be outside. Sometimes, well, we, um, we haven't slept in one of these, but as a kind of emergency procedure, what we do is we uh, dig uh, tree wells. So with, you've got all that snow dumping down. Uh, typically you've got these trees, pine trees, uh, different types of firs, you'll get tree wells. So it's in around the base of the trees, actually very little snow. Uh, and these can be used for emergency shelters because it's a ready-made hole in the ground. So a little bit of effort, you can quickly at least get out of the wind. Uh, you may not get it covered, but it's a great way for uh, emergency shelters to get, uh, you know, sheltered in, in a very short period of time, 30 minutes, and you could be out of a very bad wind uh, and into some shelter. Uh, so those are tree wells. They're quite dangerous as well. There's some scary videos online of people falling into tree wells when they're skiing uh, and not being able to get out. And um, because of that sugar snow, it doesn't, there's no perch, there's no grip. Um, but they, they have their uses. And then igloos. So igloos take time. That's one thing I'll tell you about igloos. Uh, again, that region we go to, that type of snow, that sugar snow is just pure useless. It will not consolidate, it will not stick together. Uh, and making um, igloos in, in that type of region is just impossible, uh, unless you get snow that's been disturbed. Uh, and what happens when you disturb snow, um, if it's been moved around, it starts to consolidate, it starts to stick to itself then. So this snow here has actually been uh, trampled on and it had quite a bit, of, well, not quite a bit, but some traffic over it. So it was actually possible to cut blocks out of it. And, and that's how true um, igloos are made. It's actually from ice blocks rather than snow. Um, but this one took probably about, I think it was about two hours to build a, quite a small snow hole. And um, there's somebody trying to get out of the snow hole and uh, good fun, good to build. Uh, and, but making a, a sizable snow hole takes quite a long time. Um, I think I'm going out of sequence, no, not. We I, uh, tried as well to make a snow, uh, sorry, uh, an igloo with a kind of a mold machine that they use in Canada. And it's quite compact. And uh, when we used it here in Ireland, we built a really a big snow hole. It was an eight foot snow hole, igloo, God, I should say, I keep saying snow hole, an igloo uh, with this uh, mold machine. And it took us about two hours to make an eight foot diameter snow oh, igloo. And um, that's quite a big igloo. And uh, two hours, bit of effort, but because the snow is so wet here, it, it worked. Whereas we tried it in the Arctic and that snow, and it took days, days to make uh, um, an igloo with it as well. So just 
all snow definitely not created they are the same there's big differences in where you go in the world and the type of snow you get um, and that's that's a lesson you can learn the hard way or you can do a bit of research and, and learn the easier way one of my favorite things about traveling through scandinavia as scandinavian countries is their outdoor um grounding their their ethics their um, facilities that they have is absolutely amazing uh the three countries norway sweden finland they have network of huts uh, all through the regions so in the forested regions out through the tundra and um, they these huts some of them are just shelters like this or they can be log cabins uh, and some of them kind of when they're closer to urban areas be like almost hostile uh, standard uh, accommodation some of them are open and free you just rock up and take your chances that it's free and oh there's nobody there um, others you, you pre-book um, you can also join the associations and you get a key and off you go you can just go from hut to hut uh, in these places and it's, it's fantastic so you can see a few of the guys here were uh, beeping in one of the huts um, in one of the open huts that night and uh, that night was probably one of the coldest nights we've had out there it was it went uh, I think it went down to about minus 27 that night and it was really borderline I'm not sure if Bradley is in at the moment but I think he, he is he's, he's probably shaking with the memory of the cold that night it was it was hard very hard going and um, it's it's uh, it's not easy but having the right kit and we'll talk about that shortly certainly makes it a bit easier So we go from this type of shelters to this as well. There's quite a range of different type of shelters you get out there. You get these beautiful idyllic uh, things that you just love to move into and throw away your phone and stay there forever. Uh, beautiful places. And um, they, they're they there, they don't get wrecked. They're not abused. It really is fantastic. Uh, so you, know, you can go and use these. So, Staying warm, and I put a stress on that, staying warm. Uh, we want to stay warm rather than get warm. Uh, we don't want to be losing our heat when we're out there. And uh, dealing with those temperatures is, is hard. And um, it, it, uh, you, you climatize, definitely you get used to it after a while, uh, but you're still gonna get cold. You still feel the cold, even no matter how long you're out there, you still have cold days. Um, but with the right equipment and the right knowledge of how to use that equipment, um you can be reasonably comfortable most of the time uh but what surprises a lot of people is how to actually stay warm and this is how you stay warm uh it's not the fancy 900 euro sleeping bag or the down jacket uh this is really the root of it all this is the foundation uh, of staying warm it's hydration uh being the number one and nutrition uh so hydration keeping our, the liquids in the body that keeps the blood from taking in and it keeps it flowing. And uh, one thing I think that a lot of people get wrong in, in here in Ireland and out there is a hydration. It's, it's something you really have to concentrate on. And uh, the women, unfortunately, uh, suffer this one because they don't want to have to pee on, out on the trail. Uh, it's harder to do, so they drink less, uh, which is the exact wrong thing to be doing. Uh, and then obviously having fuel in the fire, uh, having food uh, as we go. It doesn't necessarily have to be warm food, believe it or not. That kind of has an impact, but not, not a huge impact. Uh, it's the actual carbs. Um, so when we're out there, we have a uh, Kieran, our expedition chef and guide. He will design a menu that is uh, all based on, on the carbs and keeping us fueled up. People think when they come out there and they spend a week or more out there with us that they're going to lose weight. Um, doesn't happen it definitely does not happen you're just eating all the time uh, you're eating a lot more than you normally would and um, it's keeping the the energy up uh, energy levels up all the time it's, it's snacking uh, a lot of snacking going on uh, but it is very very important so when we're out there we have uh, our sleep systems and it's different sleep systems this is something that's supposed to People kind of just think well, the sleeping bag and and mat and yeah that's kind of typically what we'll use most of the time but do, do be aware that there's other sleep systems out there um and so straight off the question arises then do we use down sleeping bags or do we use synthetic sleeping bags right and really there's no difference um 
the, it's, it, the, the biggest difference is, is the weight of one over the other. Um, and down is definitely more efficient. Uh, it, it does keep you warm for less weight, but synthetic bags can equally do the same amount of warmth. Heavier, yes, but they will do the same job as well. So the advantages of synthetic bags is that even if they're wet, if they're saturated, they will actually provide warmth. Whereas a down sleeping bag saturated um, won't be as efficient. Uh, now they can get a lot of down is treated to be water repellent and things like that, but it has its limits to how much it can withstand. So sleeping bags all come rated. Uh, sorry, I'll retract that one there. It's good sleeping bags come with proper rating, all right? Heavy sleeping bag comes with ratings, but manufacturers, every manufacturer makes up their own rating system. There's no standard out there. So you can go and you can buy a 30 euro four, sleeve, four season sleeping bag and it will tell you, it'll do you down to minus 20. Um, whereas the sleeping bag you're looking at on the screen is a four season sleeping bag. It's a minus 26 and it's 900 euros. So you gotta be very careful if you're looking at kit like this um, to do your research when you're, when you're looking at specialist kit. Uh, there's, there's a lot of differences and there's a lot of things you need to be aware of. But, you know, ask around, the advice is there and um, there's a lot of knowledge uh, out there with people and they're, they're always happy to share that knowledge. So typically we will use, as I said, either down or synthetic uh, sleeping bags. And that mummy shape with the hood is very important. Uh, it's all about trapping heat. And uh, again, back to what I'm saying about staying warm. We want to trap heat. None of this kit, it doesn't matter how much you spend on it, none of it makes you warm. All it does is keeps you warm, okay? And this, that, again, is another mistake that people make. They think that when they get this fantastic jacket that they are going to be super warm. It's going to be make me super hot and warm all the time. It's not. All it's going to do is trap your body heat and store, store it, insulate. And different sleeping bags, different jackets, whatever it is, will do that to very various different degrees of uh, efficiency. And that's what it comes down to. Uh, when you're dealing with kit like this. So it's all about staying warm. None of it makes you warm. What makes you warm is this, and exercise movement. This keeps you warm. When we're in the tents and on that snow, the heat can get just sucked out of us uh, through the snow because it's so cold, massive difference in temperatures and it just gets drained into the ground if we don't have uh, proper insulation underneath us. So typically we we'll use like a thermal rest um, uh, mats and even we put a foam mat underneath these as well sometimes uh, when it's extremely cold. Um, again, back to the pulks, having the luxury of being able to carry that amount of kit, uh, it makes for more comfortable nights. With these type of mats as well, uh, something you should always look for is R values. Um, that's the, the amount of insulation it's given you. If you, you, when you're looking at a good kit, it, it will have an R value. And an R value is an official figure on this one. It's a standard figure. And you'll see it in insulation on your uh, windows and uh, insulation, house insulation, everything like that has R values. And so it comes in uh, with sleeping mats as well. And um, so it's something to look out for. So then dressing. Uh, so we use the layering system typically. Now, again, this is something that was a lot of people aware of and not aware of is that there's other systems. Um, it's, not, it's not just layering systems out there. There's other systems that um, can be single layer systems. Uh, there's another layer that's a vapor barrier system, which is quite a difficult one to get right. It's basically like wearing a plastic bag. Um, it's, um, if you don't get it right, it's, it, things go pear-shaped very quickly. But the layering system is probably the easiest one. We use it here all the time and it's the most common sense one. So we're building up layers uh, from the inside out. Um, we always recommend Merino. Uh, Merino is a very efficient uh, material wool and it is great for long-term wearing. You can wear Merino for a week and it doesn't stink is the, the great thing about Merino. Uh, but it also is super warm and super great. I keep you warm, I should say. Um, the synthetics do work as well, and um, uh, but they stink very quickly, uh, whereas the merinos don't. And then we're building it up with our layers. We got our fleeces, and then we have our jackets. And again, it can be down or it can be uh, synthetic. It really doesn't make a difference. Uh, 
uh, which you're using down is lighter, it compacts more, it's easier to pack it down and store it and carry it. Um, synthetics work, but you just need more of it and it's heavier, uh, but it's more robust generally. Um, down jackets, um, if they get wet or, you know, sometimes if you get a little nick on the jacket and the down starts to come out of it, it that can be an issue. And gloves, I, I'm always harping on about gloves. So if I was out in these conditions on a typical day, out on the skis, pulling the pulp, I am probably going to have probably at least five pairs of gloves with me. Um, I'm going to have a big pair of mitts, even probably heavier than those. I'm going to have those, which would be my gauntlets. And then I would have liner gloves. And typically liner gloves are gloves I'm going to leave on nearly all the time. With liner gloves, liner gloves are great because it means you can take off a heavier glove and you can do that more intricate work, putting up zips, tying the, uh, your shoes, different things. You can do that in trick at work and then get the big gloves back on again quickly. Uh, and then I might have another kind of intermediate uh, weight of glove as well. So gloves, there's no one glove out there that does it all. And um, uh, the mitts, mitts are great because the mitts uh, are great at trapping heat in, across all your fingers. Um, so the typically what I said I would have would be gloves like this. I'd have a bigger pair, which would be mitts and uh, usually I'd have down. That's one time I probably would recommend down because they are quite bulky if they're synthetic. Uh, so down mitts, uh, this type of glove, a gauntlet, and then a thinner pair of fleece gloves. And then I would have probably three or four pairs of liner gloves. And the reason I bring so many liner gloves is that, well, they get wet. I can just replace them quickly or they're, they're very small. So typically you'll lose them as well. Um, so gloves, big, if one you want to get right and uh, if you're looking at thinking of buying gloves they said there's no one glove that does everything but invest in gloves if you're spending money uh, if you're going to do winter stuff whether it's in scotland here uh, or further afield definitely you want to invest in gloves you will not regret it and then at the end of it it's, it's coming down to blocking the wind it's the wind chill uh, is the biggest problem uh, when there is a wind picking up it, it's um, we're generally not going to get wet uh, from the snow, but the wind, if it hits exposed skin, we get wind chill. And the easiest and most efficient way to eliminate that is to cover up the exposed skin. Uh, so goggles and the buffs and um, the, the jackets, the, the shells. This is something that people wonder, why do you bring a rain shell to the Arctic? Uh, it's, it's a wind barrier. And even here in Ireland, a lot of the time you're using your rain jacket as a wind barrier. It may not be raining, but if you're cold, put on your shell and you'll warm up pretty quick. So then that's bringing us on to food and water. And um, so uh, sometimes we will cook on fires out there, not, not often. So, so one thing I didn't touch on was the type of grounds that we go through. So we have what's called boreal uh, forests. Um, this is a mixture of open ground and forests and um, the other type of ground would we, be tundra. That's the open ground, there's no trees. Um, it's just pure mountain or fells um, or um, plateaus and it's just covered in snow. Uh, so typically we would move through those type of grounds, those type of two different type of areas, boreal forests and tundra. So in the forests, we have access to wood and um, uh, it's cooking on fires is it's messy, but it's actually it is great uh, more for the morale for one thing. Um, but being able to cook uh, on on the fires means that we're not having to carry as much fuel with us. Um, but then there's the environmental uh, aspect of it as well. So it's trying to find that balance uh, between fire and uh, our own uh, stoves is is the the trick. So when it comes down to using stoves, there's two options. And uh, one is gas, as what we can see here in the photo, and then the other is liquid fuels. And gas is great because it's there in a cylinder, you screw it on, you fire it up, off you go. Uh, but the biggest problem with gas is it does not like cold. So gas cylinders like this will work probably down to a minus eight-ish. Um, with a bit of effort and a bit of insulation, uh, you can get them down a little bit lower. But if you go down below minus 10, minus 12, the gas just will not burn, quite simply. It just simply will not work. Um, and if you haven't planned for that, well, then you're in trouble uh, because you've got no hot water. 
so then becomes the, the option then is to use liquid fuels. So liquid fuel stoves uh, will burn, um, they'll burn petrol, uh, they'll burn white, white gas, um, a lot of different things. And they're very versatile. They're kind of a dirty stove, they need a lot of cleaning. Uh, but when traveling abroad, it's very easy to get a fuel for us. So if you're going to develop in world countries, it's easy to get petrol, you know, you can get it everywhere. Um, but not the cleanest, but it's, it's easy to, to find. So that makes liquid fuel stoves um, a lot more versatile and they will work at temper in the very low temperatures and at altitude as well. So they are quite uh, scary though. That's the problem with them. It takes quite a lot of practice to get right, to learn how to uh, ignite them. Um, they can flare up this, you know, they're, 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 they are problematic. Um, so, Two different types of stoves. We got gas and we have the liquid fuel stoves. And then the food, as I said, how important it was, you know, a lot of the times we use the dehydrated meals and we will typically buy these in big packs, uh, wholesale packs, uh, so we're not dragging along loads of plastic with us. Um, and the great thing about this is that they, you know how many calories that pack has got 510 calories. It's easy to measure out your calories. You're not having to find out the calories for every element of your food. It makes planning very easy when, easy when you're using these type of meals. Uh, and they are quite tasty. They have come a long, long way. Uh, there was a time when these meals were just awful. They really were. But there's a lot of uh, companies now doing some really nice stuff. And uh, uh, we have an Irish company coming up, uh, hopefully in the next year or so as well, that's going to be uh, providing um, some dehydrated meals, which is, is great to see a, an Irish or a provider coming on the scene. Doesn't always have to be dehydrated food. Uh, depending on the, where we are, uh, we can get a get bit more luxurious with our breakfast here. This is a, a sausage and grits. Uh, it's a great, great breakfast, great start to the morning, and uh, it always goes down very well. So that brings us on to water, and uh, it's very unusual for us to see, to get a vista like this, to see water uh, nearly all the time it's frozen. And uh, the reason this water is, uh, hasn't frozen is because of its movement. Uh, so that's the only time that water won't freeze is when it's moving. And um, this one here, this water is actually flowing down uh, into the lake and the bits that you can see that the, the, the ice is starting to encroach onto it but it's, it, I've never seen it fully frozen over. So when we get something like this, a campsite near something like this, well, then life is easy. We can just get an abundance of water, but it's, it's a rarity to get this. So typically we would have to um, get down to the water on, on the rivers, find a river and then make our way down through it. And that, that, that's hard work, especially with, um, you think with an ice axe or a, something like that, you get through it. But you try and get through a half a meter of ice uh, with an axe, and it is almost impossible. Um, so these poles here are used uh, locally for um, digging down. It takes time, but uh, they work. But probably the most efficient thing to use is, is an auger. Um, the augers are great, extremely quick uh, for, for boring a hole. So they use these for opening up a water hole or for fishing. Um, they, they will use them as well. Um, so quick and easy, but a bit of Bit of bulk um, it's not something we would typically carry with us um, uh, in the pokes it's just a little bit too much so once we get a water hole open then it's a case of just bucketing the water out of there at night we would try and cover the hole to insulate it because it would just freeze back up to a half a meter of ice again if we didn't uh, so we insulate the um the ice holes at night uh, there'll always be ice on us the next morning but not, not so much, hopefully, that so we can just open it back up again. And then worst case scenario, we have to melt ice. And this really is something we try and avoid uh, as much as possible because of the amount of energy it takes, the amount of fuel it takes to melt ice is huge. And uh, if we have an alternative, we will always do it. We'll try and carry as much water as we can, um, but if we have to melt ice, then we'll do it. We don't want to be melting snow, um, so because snow has got very little moisture in it. Is one of the first things I spoke about not being able to make a, a snowball uh, because the moisture content is so little. So it's very uh, inefficient trying to melt snow. Uh, but whereas ice, if we can get ice, um, then melting that gives us uh, a lot more water. It's a lot more water and ice. Uh, but 
it takes time and it takes fuel and uh, that then feeds into our planning uh, for our overnights when we're heading out for multiple days well are we going to be able to get a water source and if not well then what sort of fuel are we going to use and how much are we going to take that all has to be factored in and in the northern lights the aurora and um we, where we go is probably one of the best places in the world for us, that and probably northern Canada and across to, to uh, Russia. And um, we do, we've been very lucky uh, with the, the northern lights. Uh, these photos are not mine, but they've been taken by local photographers all out in that area. And um, the northern lights are basically uh, solar winds that come in and hit the magnetic fields uh, of the polar regions. And they can happen any time of day, um, they can happen any time of year. But obviously you need a clear night and a uh, dark night to see them, even though that one, that's actually the moon uh, in that photo. They are spectacular, uh, an amazing thing to see. Um, I always thought that, you know, you see these videos on um, YouTube where the lights are dancing. And I always thought they were speeded up until one night uh, out there. Um, we were out and the lights started and they started dancing and they did that movement and it's just a very special thing to see so you get the different colors typically green but you'll get whites you'll get purples uh red kind of hues as well and that brings us to the end of our presentation and um there is the uh the link for anybody who wants to uh find out what we do if you're thinking about joining us out there uh, we go out every uh, February and March with groups on our Arctic expedition. We've got two different types of trips we do out there. Uh, one is the expedition, another one is a three country ski trip where we ski uh, from Finland into Sweden into Norway and back, and uh, pulling our polk, each of us with a polk, pulling all your kit and going hut to hut on that one. Um, but do definitely take a look at, the, at those uh, adventure.ie forward slash Arctic and you'll get a, a great insight as to what we do. So, and so that's bringing us to the end of our presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, let me see. Just unmute yourselves there and hop in if you want to ask a question. It's the handiest. So Cindy and uh, Paul, I think, have been answering questions there. Just scrolling through questions here. Cool. OK, so the I got an echo there. Super, guys. So, isn't we will send you um, kind of a summary of all of these uh, presentations uh, over the next few days as well, with any links and um, or kind of links to the other talk speakers as well. Um, there's a lot of experienced people giving talks over the weekend, and uh, if you're thinking of training or looking for training uh, or experiences.